I want to introduce Karen Vaughan. Karen. It would be fair to say that before our son's death, Billy and I thought that we understood the severity that we faced as a nation under this current administration. But after his death, we began searching for answers, as Billy told you already. And as we searched, we became tragically aware that perhaps the cruelest, most deceitful acts of this administration have been perpetrated against the very ones fighting and dying to protect and defend it. We found that on the night our son and 29 other brave, fearless American warriors were shot out of the sky on a mission to capture a high value in the Tangy River Valley of Afghanistan, we learned that this valley was an incredibly hostile territory, which our military had cleared on seven prior occasions and then turned back over to the Afghanis, who could not maintain its stability. We learned that night that the mission was so dangerous that it had to be authorized out of theater, but even then the following took place. The most elite warriors in our nation's history, the now unfortunately not so secret SEAL Team 6, were flown into battle, as Billy said that night, on a CH-47D Chinook chopper rather than the Special Forces aviation that these men trained with throughout their entire careers. Even more insulting, this conventional airframe that these 30 Americans were forced to do battle in that night was built in the early 1960s and last retrofitted in 1985. We demand to know who made the call to send our sons into hostile territory where evidence proves a shoot-down attempt had been in full force for weeks in less than adequate antiquated airframes documented to be in very poor condition. We also demand to know who made the call to mix conventional aircraft and forces with special warfare operations. In our search, we also discovered that Extortion 17 entered the battle zone that night completely unescorted with no pre-assault fire paving the way for that school bus, if you will, to make it slow contemplated landing in that pitch black hostile territory, a territory which had been engaged in a military battle for three and a half hours. According to military records, we were also told that the entire valley that night before that entrance of that chopper was in a heightened state of alert. So why were they unescorted? That's a question we still have no answers for. It was standard protocol, but it didn't happen. Why was there no pre-assault fire? We were told as families that because pre-assault fire damages our efforts to win the hearts and minds of our enemy. So in other words, the hearts and minds of our enemy are more valuable to this government than my son's blood. This submission, this is submission. And the cost of that submission on August 6th was my only son and these other people's children as well as 26 others who aren't represented here today. Perhaps the most disturbing piece of evidence that Billy and I came across in our search for truth was uncovering the fact that the Afghan National Army, the Afghan National Police, and the Afghan Security Ministry are, have been, and still are involved in the planning of every single stage of every single special operation that takes place in that country. And yes, these plans include flight routes and landing zones. We are well aware that these agencies have been infiltrated. They actually brag about it. Yet our strategy does not change. In turn, we've been left with a lot of unanswered questions, and I'm just going to name four very quickly. Where did the intel come from that night that led us to believe Kari to, to here was actually in the Tangy River Valley, too? The operation was spun up with such urgency that many mistakes were made. So I ask, what was the urgency of the operation that night? No one interviewed in the 1,250 pages of documentation we have can answer that question. Number three, in keeping with that question, we want to know who the out-of-theater commander was that made the call 
to initiate a quick reactionary force when there was no nation withheld from the investigative team. On a broader stroke, our sons and daughters are being asked to lay their lives on the line day in and day out under rules of engagement that predominantly favor their enemy's protection over their own. We were recently told by a special forces operator that under the current ROEs, if the enemy fires on you, then runs back behind a rock, when he pops his head up from behind the rock, you're not allowed to engage him unless you can verify that he has not laid his gun down. This is insanity. In other words, you must be fired on twice now or your actions will be questioned by your government when you try to defend yourself or the lives of your teammates. Our men and women are dying by the droves under our current leaders and for no good reason. They have become simple pawns in a violent political game. But go ahead, Mr. President. Send us all form letters when our sons pay their last full measure for your country. Play another round of golf. Laugh it up on the talk shows. And completely ignore and conceal the fact that 79% of the deaths in the now 11 plus years of war in Afghanistan have happened under your command in four short years. Also ignore the fact that in the eight plus years under your predecessor, there were 2,724 soldiers wounded in action in Afghanistan, but in three short years, with you at the helm, Mr. President, 14,977 soldiers have come home maimed and forever changed. We have an ideology problem in this war, and it's high time we address it. Recently, an Army Ranger shared his heart with me regarding his much earlier than hoped for retirement from a job he had once loved and believed in. His words to me, quote, I have a family who needs me, Karen. I had to get out. I didn't join to be sacrificed. I joined to fight. Several others have spoken almost identical words to us over the past two years. Many others weren't fortunate enough to make that decision before their final deployment. My son and the men of Extortion 17 spent every part of themselves. They gave up so much of the life the rest of us enjoy. They persevered through unimaginable odds to earn the right to step onto that helicopter on August 5th in the Tangy River Valley. The least their president and high-ranking military leaders could have done is offered them every opportunity to come home to their families, who have now instead been left broken and forever changed. But then, as if dying due to, in no small part, this nation's submission to its enemy was not enough. Our sons' bodies were then subjected to the final act of betrayal by their government as military leaders stood by and not only allowed an imam to pray their souls into eternal fire, proclaiming the Muslims the winners, but went on foolishly to praise the beautiful relationship between our two nations, fighting together as one. Our families were subjected to what I could, would consider an atrocity on August 9th of 2011 at Dover Air Base. We stood stunned as 38 unidentified caskets were ceremonially paraded in front of us, each with equal honor. 30 were covered appropriately with the American flag Eight, with equal honor, were draped with the Afghani flag, which raises another question that I demand an answer to. Since most of the remains, due to a terrible fire in the explosion, had to be identified through DNA and dental records here in the States, is it possible that one or more of our sons, that my son, came home under the Islamic Republic of Afghanistan's flag, all for the guise of appeasement. The very thought fills my heart with more anger and pain than I could possibly express. I, along with every parent I've spoken with who has lost a child in the crash of Extortion 17, am outraged by this final act of contempt for the dignity of our sons remains, and we demand that someone answers for that unspeakable lack of judgment, to put it kindly. May we stand together and bravely face this enemy who seems to have dominion over our nation's very soul. May we be bold enough to speak the truth and fierce enough to challenge the lies. 
As one of the parents from the crash recently reminded me, I am no longer accepting the things I cannot change. It is now time to change the things I cannot accept. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Well said. After I gave my introduction, Congressman Louis Gohmert came, and we want to thank him for his great support uh, to this cause to change things that we can change. I now want to introduce uh, Doug Hamburger, whose son Patrick sadly died in that crash, also uh, needlessly. <laughs> 